finally rejuvenating the riverfront, adding the word boulevardier to the Kansas City lexicon. Plus, if you want to get elected to local office, is being a celebrity name enough? A shoo-in at the NEA. And what does Cantor's stunning defeat mean for the Roberts Senate race in Kansas? Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Are you ready to go behind the headlines making news in Kansas City? It's 30 minutes of pithy and insightful analysis from our four journalists who have been charged with tracking the week's stories on both sides of state line. Eric Wesson is senior writer for The Call newspaper. Mary Sanchez is a nationally syndicated columnist for The Kansas City Star. Also with a star political reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. And from The Pitch newspaper, reporter, Steve Vokrot. Is Kansas City finally paying attention to its riverfront? It's been long ignored, but this week, what is being described as the first vertical development on Kansas City's riverfront in more than 100 years is announced. After decades of inaction, a $65 million development featuring 398 luxury uh, apartments, retail, a fitness club, pool, and a sky bar is detailed on a five-acre adjacent site. Uh, to the Bar Berkeley Riverfront Park. Now, why has it taken, though, this long for there to be development along the river when a downtown waterway is normally considered a prized asset in most cities, Steve? Well, the, 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 the riverfront for decades, for part of its history, was a city dump, so nothing could really be put down there. It's not the most accessible area in the downtown area. And the agency that's in charge of it, the Port Authority, uh, over the years has had some trouble at some points, most recently during the Funkhauser era. Um, so this seems to be a sign that the Port Authority is getting its act together to a certain degree. And with all the development going on downtown, it only makes sense that the riverfront would get a piece of that action. Uh, we see apartments proposals coming up like weeds almost in downtown. So I think this is just the latest migration of that type of development. What would having apartments like this, and these are not just any apartments, luxury apartments going there at the riverfront do to our own psyche, our own feeling about the riverfront there, Mary? Well, hopefully it'll raise it that they put something down there that people, you know, deem as a place that they want to be, a place that they want to go. I mean, and that's, I'm kind of a little bit on the build it and we will see and we will come. I don't know. It's That riverfront area is still so, it's fairly desolate down there. Um, and it isn't very accessible. I mean, I applaud it. You almost wonder historically to look back why things haven't happened if some of it almost even goes back to the River Key area. If that would have not literally imploded, um, might that development have marched eastward anyway? And then it, just, it never did. For but so much expectation and nothing has happened there, though, Dave. Well, a little history lesson may be in order. It, it, you're, uh, Steve and, and Mary are right. Inaccessibility is a problem, but it is much more accessible than it used to be because the Port Authority spent $20 million in riverboat gaming money to build the viaduct, to build the bridge from Grand Avenue down into that park and then built the park. So, so th th there have been efforts for a quarter century to entice some sort of development to that riverfront site. There were environmental problems. They spent millions to clean those up, not just from the dump, but from an old coal tar uh, uh, plant that was on the site. Um, it, it, it seems uh, I, the problem isn't accessibility, perhaps, as much as it is isolation. You really are down the hill from downtown. You're sort of between bridges. Uh, they've tried uh, developer after developer, and we'll see what happens on this one. Eric. And when they started doing the fireworks displays down there several years ago, I thought that that would be the avenue to bring people down to let them see, you know, that that's not such a bad place to start developing down there. Uh, I think there were some TIF dollar issues about going down there, but it usually, in, to the riverfront, but it's a great place to start, and like Dave said, it's kind of down and it's kind of uh, secluded, but it's a great opportunity. Steve, you mentioned, though, at the very somewhere. beginning, though, that apartment complexes are now coming up like weeds, mm -hmm. sprouting up like weeds in, in downtown. Uh, is there too many at this point? Well, that's, I mean, that's starting to be the question in my mind and some other people's minds that, you know, at what point is the market going to get oversaturated? Uh, but it is, a, it is a goal of city leaders to get more people living downtown because then it makes the 
uh, investment in retail and things like the Power and Light District make more sense. So uh, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big draw and, for the city. And the streetcar as well. Remember, the streetcar will go into the city market, and there is some argument that even though these apartments are separated to some degree, that transit from that area down into Midtown will be easy. Now, speaking of underappreciated areas of the city, after years of planning, a new Kansas City festival is joining the Metro's summer events calendar. It's called Boulevardia, and it starts Friday in the often ignored West Bottoms. Billed as a three-day food, beer, and music festival, it's designed to celebrate Boulevard Beer's 25th birthday. Would they have known when they were planning this event that they would no longer be the hometown beer? Since October, they've been owned by a Belgian based brewer at the time local beer drinkers were crying foul has that overseas ownership had an impact on the taste of boulevard beer or the company's commitment to kansas city steve not as far as i can tell you know there some of the some of the hand wringing that went on about the sale of this of, of boulevard was odd to me there were some people who complained that a local owner didn't step in and buy it and i don't really know who locally was supposed to come in and buy it uh, and it's not like they got bought by a hedge fund that's going to start trying to pinch their margins and sacrificing quality for profits. And it wasn't bought by Anheuser-Busch. This was bought by a respected brewery that caters towards the type of beer that Boulevard puts out. It's not beer necessarily for the masses. It's like a Bud Light or a Coors Light. It's, it's, it's craft beer. You know, it's what both, it's what both breweries have, have always done. So I don't really know that the ownership issue has been that much of an impact. And this is going to be a festival that is going to be next, basically, to the haunted houses, I think, as the pitch said it, next to the edge of hell. Uh, this is a, a area that has not got a huge amount of attention and is often maligned. Well, which I would say wrongly. I mean, there actually is a lot of activity down there. I've spent a lot of time recently because the uh, earthworks artist, Stan Hurd, is down there doing a project that starts here in Kansas City in the West Bottoms and we'll end up over in Brazil for the Olympics in 2016. And there's really actually quite a lot that is starting to go on down there. It's just a matter of, like all these developments, how fast it goes along, you know, what are the barriers in between. I'm excited to see this boulevard yet. Which, I mean, st which starts today, Friday, and it goes on till Sunday day. One of the central problems that I've talked about, we've talked about around this table though for 20 years, Nick, is that uh, Mary's right, uh, you know, the, the West Bottoms is prime real estate. Let's build housing there. No, 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 let's, let's build it on the riverfront. That's where we really need to, to, to focus and, and city market. No, no let's, let's do it at Power and Light District. That's where we really need housing and development or maybe Midtown. Kansas City's attention, uh, attention span in terms of areas it wants to rebuild is very scattered. And as a result, you know, we sort of leap from idea to idea, and I don't think any of them are executed at the speed most people would like. That's why you've waited on the riverfront. That's why we're still waiting down at the Power and Light, or I mean, um, uh, the West Bottoms. That's why the Power and Light District took 20 years to get off the ground. Our, our, our attention span can be divided in this community sometimes. And we're waiting still on 18th and Vine. 18th and Vine. You know, we're build housing there, you know, the worst, yeah. that's a 25-year quarter century because nobody said, let's fix 18th and Vine and then go to the riverfront. It's let's do it all at once, and as a result, you don't really get anything done. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor suffered a stunning primary defeat this week in Virginia at the hands of a Tea Party backed challenger. University professor David Bray uh, defeated the number two House Republican soundly. After criticizing him for not being conservative enough, Bratt also called Cantor soft on immigration. It was the first time a House majority leader had been defeated in a primary election since 1899 when the position was created. In Kansas, Tea Party candidate Milt Wolf, Sir Eric Cantor's defeat spells trouble for Senator Pat Roberts. Does it, Dave? Well, uh, I've told other people this. Uh, normally the answer might be no, but nobody knows for sure what's going on, particularly after what happened to Eric Cantor, because nobody thought that Dave Brad had any chance at all. So I think politicians, consultants, and for that matter, political reporters are going back to their notes, saying, what are we missing? W what are we not seeing? So that's a long-winded way of saying that uh, Milton Wolf has new life. Now, whether he can ride that to victory or not is a, is a very different question, but he is not, his chances are not zero as many people thought they were just a week ago because of what happened in Virginia. Steve. Well, you know, as, as it relates to Cantor's race, a lot of the attention got directed towards immigration, but I think another factor in Cantor's defeat was he was 
he, w he was pigeonholed as a congressman who had been around too long, who was deeply entrenched with the lobbyists in K Street, and had kind of forgotten about his constituents. And you see Milton Wolf is doing the same thing. Uh, so that could come into play. However, Milton Wolf is, as Robert's campaign has said, is a deeply flawed candidate. And you know, the, the, the development with him putting up photos on Facebook of uh, yeah. medical photos was deeply troubling. The, um, Steve brings up the immigration issue, which um, it was viewed, uh, David Bratt saying that um, Eric Cantor was soft on immigration, but certainly in, in this U.S. Senate race in Kansas, the immigration issue isn't even coming up in that race, is it, Mary? No, it hasn't so far. That's always one of the, and I'm actually just about ready to post a column on this topic. Um, it's such an easy issue for people to drum up votes from people who don't understand the issue well. And definitely, Dave Bratt played that card. But it was just one card. And the other one, really, that helped him out, though, was, yes, Cantor's own inability to move his own district. And then also, he had talk radio. Laura Ingram and a whole group of others were really strongly behind him. And he played that very well. And he got, it was a small percentage of the voters, actually. But it was enough to win. So one we'll, of the things that, that stuck out with me the most was the conversation of he wasn't conservative enough. And I think that we heard that when Claire McCaskill was running and her Republican opponent for that, for the Senate race, is the key term now. They're not conservative enough as a, a thing to connect with Tea Party uh, bases. So what would Milt Wolf have to do, Dave Helling, to actually beat Pat Roberts? Uh, get more votes, uh, first of all. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and, and, but I also, hope he's watching. I hope yes, his campaign's watching. But uh, um, they pay a lot of money for that advice. It, it's a little. It's a little diff. You know, one of the challenges he faces is taking the strategies that work in a congressional district, which is compact, and you, you get a chance to sort of retail, you know, conduct retail politics in a congressional district, and it, and bringing that to an entire state. That's difficult. Kansas is a big state geographically. It's hard to get to everybody. Different media markets. So he has to sort of overcome that, and then he has to make the accusation that Pat Roberts is old and out of touch and has been in Washington too long. Stick, and to that uh, degree. The Thad Cochran race in Mississippi, which is a Senate race, is, will give us a good indication as to whether that, that kind of thing can be made. Okay. He is Kansas City sports legend, and now he's running for political office. But how much does name recognition get you? Big billboards for Royals Hall of Famer Frank White, along with his household name status, should make him a shoe in right, for a seat on the Jackson County Legislature? But not so fast. His opponent, veteran firefighter and union leader Sherwood Smith, has raised 10 times more cash than White as of the last reporting period. And he's also piled up the heaviest hitting endorsements. He's got the support of the mayor, former mayor Kay Barnes, U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill, Attorney General Chris Costa, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, the firefighters unions, the Fraternal Order Police, and the labor union, the AFL-CIO. So what's happening here is name recognition and celebrity status not all that it's cracked up to be when it comes to running for local office, Eric. In this case, no. Uh, uh, Sherwood went out and got those endorsements and that support early before Frank White even got into the race. So some of them, I wonder whether they would have went with him if they had known while Frank was deciding what he was going to do. I think it's a race. And I think that Frank is going to have to campaign and not rely on the name recognition because Sherwood is out hustling. He's raising money. He's connecting to people. People are familiar with him, but not so much. In the Jackson County part that he's got to deal with, Eastern Jack, uh, you know, they love Frank White. So it's going to be an interesting Now, race. was this a big surprise then to the Frank White campaign that this has not been the shoe-in they might have expected? Steve? Um, perhaps, but, you know, I... Personally, I wouldn't stick my neck out and make a prediction for how this race is going to go because you never know what the turnout's going to be like in a race like this. The dynamics are really hard to predict. And I think a lot of people just don't really understand what the Jackson County Legislature does. They meet in the, you know, occasionally in the basement of a courthouse in Independence. It's not the most visible political seat out there in local politics. But they discussed things like commuter rail, which was going to be a huge issue in, a, in our area just right. about a year ago. And they, they run the stadium. And the research tax was right. something that started with the Jackson County Legislature. Right, and they run the stadiums. I mean, they do have some responsibilities. Steve is right, though. Generally, the county legislature is, is the forgotten body in local politics. Uh, I wouldn't predict either, but boy, it's going to be tough to, to, in a race that is kind of difficult to see, 
to beat a guy like Frank White. The, 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 when you go into the polling place and you don't know anything about either candidate, to see that name on the ballot, it, it, it's almost the default position. It, Sherwood has a lot of, um, of endorsements, as everyone points out. Whether that translates into enough votes for victory, we'll have to see. Shortly after his election, Mayor Sly James was summoned to a meeting of business leaders. On his arrival, he noticed one overwhelming similarity. Everyone in the room was a white male except him. Women were totally absent. Regardless of where I am, there generally aren't very many women in those rooms when I show up. There have been times when it's been such an absence so noted under the circumstances that it required some comment, such as, if I'm not coming back until you change it, uh, type of a comment, just to kind of get the point across. Two months ago, James announced a new initiative with the Women's Foundation of Greater Kansas City called the Appointments Project to create a talent bank of women to serve on city boards and commissions. This week, the first woman who applied through the initiative will be added to a city hall board. That's Cecilia Carter, who joins the Employees Retirement System Board of Trustees. At the time we discussed this two months ago, I received several tweets that said, it's time to start talking about it. It's time to see action. So does this constitute action, or is this just a token appointment, Mary? No, I don't think it's a token at all, but, um, partly because there was a whole process behind it. What they did is, through the Women's Foundation, um, Greater Kansas City Women's Foundation, they actually created almost like another portal to go through so that they went out and they made the point, uh, we want more women on all these, there's hundreds of boards and commission positions. And a lot of people don't even know about them, but they are very important. And it's also, it's often a way where people kind of put their foot out there into civic service. Women have a tendency not to be in that network. And so what they did is they put the call out and they've gotten, it's not only this one, there's some others lined up in the queue ready to be hopefully considered and perhaps appointed if they're chosen by the mayor as being the person that's the best qualified. But it just added another avenue and it tapped a group of women who are you know, business professionals, they're well educated, and it just tried to do a different way of matching them up with these positions. Is this just a token appointment or is this putting words into action? Eric? Uh, this is putting words into action. I don't think it's a token. I think, that, like uh, Mary said, the process this slide uses for appointments is very intense, is very detailed. So it's, it's something. Now, the next question is, is he going to go to a woman as his chief of staff to uh, make that appointment look like he's really doing something toward her, or is he going to make women more visible in his office? That's going to be the question. They already are. That I He's think. outnumbered big time. I think it's like 13 staffers and what was it, 11, 12, I forget the number right now, are female. I mean, the guy's yeah. surrounded. Well, but it's okay. more other cities have actually looked at, and this is just a sliver of his whole initiative. We'll see where everything goes. But other cities are looking at this portion of it as a way that they might be able to have some of the same end result. Well, Kansas City has had women in leadership yeah. positions for yeah. decades. Sure. Yeah. Extraordinarily willing, in, on both sides of the state line, I must say, to elect women candidates to office. And you can just go down the list. Kay Barnes, Catherine Shields, Claire McCaskill, Carol Marinovich, Kathleen Sebelius, Annabeth Serbaugh. Jan My Annabeth Serbaugh, Jan Myers. I mean, the, the, the voters of this, on bo again, both sides of the state line are quite willing to elect women candidates. So you do get the sense that there is some, uh, the onus in some ways is on women in this community to step forward, to put themselves out there. And this outreach is good, but it's only one part of a broader attempt to get more women back into government. Well, speaking of women in leadership positions, the CEO of Kansas City's Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts, Jane Shu, late this week was confirmed by the United States Senate to be the new head of the National Endowment for the Arts. With the recent departure of Kathleen Sebelius as health secretary, is Shu now the highest profile regional figure in an administration post, Mary? Um, well, it probably depends on your circles. I mean, to a lot of people, they may not consider this a very high position. They don't know what, you know, the organization does. It's good for Kansas City. It's someone who understands and clearly loves Kansas City, is very closely tied to one of our wonderful resources of the Kauffman Center. And so it's all good. I don't know that 
you know, what it, if it means that much politically or anything. There are just so many other avenues um, to have a voice for the city. There was no real big disagreement about her being the head of the National Endowment for the Arts, given all of the controversy in that agency and given the polarization of politics in Washington. Why was that, Dave Helling? Well, because I think Jane Chu was extraordinarily well qualified. She had support on both sides of the aisle. There are other areas for which Republicans and Democrats can disagree in Washington. I think it is a bit of a loss to Kansas City. She was an extraordinary leader of the Kaufman Center, Performing Arts Center. Uh, so, but good for her and, and really good for the region and arguably good for the arts. I, well. I just think it's interesting given how things have changed for the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, uh, Jane Shu oversaw a $413 million campaign to build the Kaufman Center. The overall budget now for the National Endowment for the Arts is $146 million, less than half, Steve Vaucrot. Right. It's gotten whittled down a lot over the years, uh, particularly among some pockets of politicians who think that government shouldn't really be involved in the arts. So if you look at the work she did around here to get the Kaufman Center up and going, that's building a lot of bridges, you know, hopefully she can do the same for the National Endowment for the Arts. From the beginning, aviation leaders in Kansas City have argued that one of the main reasons for moving forward on a brand new single terminal at KCI was to address environmental problems. We have three terminals. All those gates, airlines are de-icing at their gates, and that fluid, which is very, very bad to the environment when it gets into our waterways, is just running everywhere. We would have to tear up all the concrete aprons around the three terminals and put in drainage systems and fuel systems. And, and that's just one aspect of, of one of the reasons that we're looking at a new terminal. City officials distributed a fact sheet in April 2013 that said KCI couldn't meet Environmental Protection Agency guidelines, which require capturing 30 percent of de-icing runoff. But according to an investigation by the Pitch newspaper, which contacted the EPA, there is no such guideline. Airports built after 2012 must collect 60 percent of those liquids. But the EPA has not established a percentage limit for existing airports such as KCI. So what has been the response from the city to your story, Steve? Well, like a lot of stories like that, you know, on a polarizing issues, the people who agree that rebuilding an airport is a sketchy idea. You know, they email me and tell me great story. The people who are promoting the single terminal, they just kind of try to ignore it. So as far as reaction, um, that's kind of how it's been. But, you know, the, the, the story itself didn't really analyze whether an airport was a good, you know, rebuilding KCI was a good idea or not. It was looking into how the city has tried to sell it uh, and politicians have tried to sell it. And it's been a clumsy affair over the course of the last year. But just because there isn't an actual EPA rule on this, isn't it still a good thing, though, that the airport does act in a very environmentally responsible way and collect all of that de-icing fluid, even if the EPA isn't telling them to do so? Well, sure. It's, it's important for it to be a, 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 in, in, in compliance with not only EPA regulations, but arguably best practices, too. However, the EPA looks at it from a number of different angles. And in the last 10 years, they've only taken one low-level compliance action against KCI, which suggests that in its present state, it's perhaps not an ongoing terrible environmental concern at this point. It's considered an act of charity when someone takes their time and resources to help those less fortunate than themselves, like the homeless. Should we make it harder for people to help? For the last several weeks now, the Kansas City Council has been debating an ordinance that would make it illegal to give food to the homeless without a food handling permit. But after a series of contentious hearings, the measure was killed Thursday in a tied vote of the council. Can someone tell me why this was a priority for council members in the first place? Eric? One of the things that one of the council members told me was when they go out and feed people, there's trash and there's, there creates a lot of other problems. And not just feeding the people, it's the after effect. So that was one of the things that was a concern. And in the areas like if you get out Brush Creek uh, or Bruce Watkins Drive, whether, rather, you uh, see sandwich wrappers on the ground, and that's where homeless people have been begging for money at the uh, stoplight. But given all of the priorities of the city council, why, why was this so big for them, do you think, Mary? Well, certain council members pushed it because there was problems up in the northeast area was, um, with some of this litter. And it really, it, it's a good issue for us to have looked at because it really reaches to that broader question of how do you really help people? And there is some mindset of if you just set up distribution centers 
where people can just come, how much does that weigh into ever helping them towards a self-sufficiency? The other line of that is, though, if someone's hungry, they're hungry. And you don't sit there and tell them, okay, you need to stay hungry longer because I really want you to go out and get a job. And it's just that sort of broader conversation did also occur around this, so I think that was a good thing. Steve. Well, some segment, you know, some folks you talk to in City Hall, they're a little skeptical of the food trucks that go around to where the homeless camps are set up uh, because they want to try and get the homeless population to the service centers, some of which are downtown, because that connects them not only with food, but for housing and jobs and, and, and mental health services and things like that. Dave. Uh, right, although uh, I can guarantee you that in this city's future will be an argument over whether we need to bring all of the poor and homeless into one place that disrupts neighborhoods, causes problems. I mean, Kansas City has struggled with this for as long as I've been in the community, and it, there, there's a wave to sort of scatter it, then there's a wave to concentrate it, scatter it again. Uh, a, a, a Steve mentioned something very important. Mental health services in this community are extraordinarily important in dealing with these issues. And there is a sense that we haven't, uh, despite good efforts on everyone's behalf, really gotten a good grip, as most urban communities have not, on how to treat mental illnesses and make that more holistic with all of these other services providing to the public. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers, the Star's nationally syndicated columnist, Mary Sanchez, and the Steve Vokrot from The Pitch, from The Call newspaper, Eric Wesson, and from The Star, Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes. Thanks for joining us.